Okay, so welcome everyone. Can you hear me? Right. I can. I think everyone else can too. <clears throat> All right. So uh, back with you after a couple of weeks with Andrew Kayan's very dense teaching. I want to take a little bit of a step backward because as we're going to see this evening, it's the events of the fifth century that make the events of the sixth century possible. And then, of course, it's going to be the events of the sixth century that make the that set the stage for the very momentous changes that will happen in Armenia in the seventh century. And in addition to the events of the century, we also have to throw into the mix of what we're considering the personalities of the people who had to deal with the fallout of fifth century events in the sixth. And we have to consider how they interpreted those fifth century events. And then with those things in place, we can see, I think, that the events of the sixth century become not just possible, but almost inevitable. When you put together the givens that they were working with, their interpretation of them and their personalities, um, it's very, it would be very hard for things to turn out other than they did. Now, this is not a phenomenon that's unique to the fifth and sixth centuries. It's also not a phenomenon that's unique to the Armenian world. In our own 21st century, we still feel the reper repercussions of ideas and ideals and ways of thinking, mindsets from the 19th century. Um, our politics was largely formed in the 20th century or sometimes even earlier. And it's on the basis of what are now these very kind of outdated ideas and ideals that we enact whatever we enact. So it's no surprise that generally speaking, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are going to look at the 21st century much more clearly, looking back on it with hindsight, than we do while we're in it. So just something to bear in mind that the, the viewpoints of the people who are in these situations that we're going to talk about are very, very much limited by what they actually see around them. They don't have the benefit of the wider perspective that we do. In every way <clears throat> and everywhere, the sixth century is a time when all of the seeds of division that were sown in the fifth come to fruition. And the divides that were implicit in the fifth century begin to expand. And as we'll see, they're going to expand to a point where there will be no further bridging of them possible. You can see this kind of fragmentation happening everywhere. So this is the beginning of the sixth century, what things look like in the, the known world from the time. And so you can see where there used to be an enormous, enormous Parthian empire. The Sasanian Persian empire is much smaller. Where is the most division? Thank goodness it's not entirely in the, in the Armenian sphere. The most division is actually in Europe, where you can see that big kingdoms have not yet come about. You can see that there are the Franks, but then there are also little groups called the Alamans, the Bergens, and so on and so forth. What is the situation like in a place where you have many competing interests, many competing types of people in a relatively small territory? Things can become very competitive. Things can easily go south in terms of people understanding one another. And as we scan across the map, the other places where there's that level of small entities in one place, India is that way. If you look at it, you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six different types of kingdoms in India. Southeast Asia is a little bit divided up like that. And the other place where there is this level of division is in Armenia, Armenia, Albania, Iberia, the things that are kind of sitting on top of the Sasanian Persian Empire and sitting just a little bit to the east 
of the very large Eastern Roman slash Byzantine empire. So one can expect that in the Armenian sphere, as in the European and the Indian, although we won't be talking about the history of India at all, there's going to be um, a lot of differences of understanding, a lot of competition, and that is uh, going to in fact be the case. Division over what? Well, here are the big divisive issues. There are four of them. The first one is the Council of Chalcedon. The second one is the separation of the Georgian church from the Armenians. The third is something called grassroots spirituality for lack of a better term. And the last one is language and Christology. So when the alphabet is developed for Armenian in the fifth century, this is a wonderful thing. It makes possible a new literature. It makes possible communication um, between Armenian groups without the kind of middleman of another language. But it also introduces um, a strange problem. When Armenians are no longer writing in Greek in a time period where there's a lot of debate going on about the nature of Christ and other kind of um, very nitpicky theological issues, the specialized vocabulary of Greek is going to look quite different when it's translated into Armenian and vice versa. And so this is going to be a time period where people, even though they're talking about the same thing and they think they're talking about the same thing in the same terms, they actually are not. And so Armenian theology is going to develop in a quite different direction from the theologies of places around it. So as we look at these issues, we're gonna be relying on a wide variety of non-Armenian sources for our information. Because in the sixth century, only six people wrote things that have survived until today. And of these six people, we only have fragments of the work of one of them, Petros Sunitsi. We don't have anything that's complete from him. Four of them, Babgen, Nerses, Krikor and Hovanes, Katoligoses, left only letters. And it's only the last name on the list, Movses Kirtohair, who left us more than that and things that are not letters. But several of the writings that are attributed to him are disputed. People aren't sure that he wrote them. Some people aren't quite sure which Movses he is. Sadly, it was a time period where there were several of them. So there's not a lot of contemporary witness, contemporary material from Armenian sources to go on. And as far as we now know, there are no native Armenian historians living in this time period and writing about contemporary events. For historians on this time period, you have to go 100, 150 years later, at which point, of course, Things have changed. So within those limitations, I want to start going back into the fifth century to the event that is the most formative for what happens in this sixth century. And that event is the Council of Chalcedon. The first of our divisions could actually be called the divided Christ. Now, from this time period, from our vantage point, when we look back on Chalcedon, we see it as, oh, watershed event. This is a defining moment in Christianity's identity. And so nowadays, the Armenians, the Copts, the Syrians, the Ethiopians identify themselves as non-Chalcedonian churches whereas the Byzantine churches and the Church of Rome call themselves Chalcedonians. So for us now, it's a critical moment. And if you go to St. Vladimir's for a church history course, you're gonna hear quite a lot about 
Chalcedon and how decisive it is and so on and so forth. But at the time that it took place, the Council of Chalcedon was not a particularly big deal, especially for Armenians. And I wanna talk about why it has changed so much. Well, partly it was not such a big decisive deal when it happened because it was the culmination, the kind of apex, <laughs> if we can give it a positive word like that, of a long and very acrimonious time of wrangling between powerful bishops. And so for the Armenians, <laughs> It probably seemed a bit like, oh, well, ho-hum, there's another cat fight going on between Byzantine bishops about issues that really have no particular relevance to Armenian Christianity. Why should we be that concerned about it? Well, the Council of Chalcedon, just to give you a little background on the cat fight, had been preceded by a smaller local council that was held in Constantinople in 448, and by another council that was held in Ephesus in 449. And these two councils, one of which the Armenians did go to, these two councils were deemed necessary because of an even earlier one that was held in Ephesus in 431. So in other words, 431, 448, 449, 451 is all part of the same ongoing strife. So for 15 years or so, this has been an ongoing struggle. So on the surface of things, all of these councils had to do with the question of whether it's proper to refer to Christ as having one nature that because it is human divine, maybe we want to make one word out of that or we want to hyphenate it just a little bit, um, is sui generis. There is not another one like it. It is one nature. It's an unrepeatable nature. It only happened that one time, it's not going to happen again. So is it better to refer to Christ as one special nature? Or is it better to talk about him as having a human nature and a divine nature that are somehow mysteriously joined together? Now, if this sounds a little bit like splitting hairs, it is. And this is an occupation that Byzantines and Westerners seem to particularly enjoy. Taking things apart, analyzing them, looking at them through a very fine lens. Armenians do not enjoy that so much. And so the heads of the Armenian church usually deployed a special subset of Vartabeds who were specifically trained to deal with debates in these areas and give the Armenians a voice in them. So yes, there are ramifications to each of those points of view, whether you prefer to call Christ one or you prefer to call him two joined. And we're gonna talk about some of those ramifications later, some of them next week and some later. But for these councils underneath all of the mostly sincere and real concern that these bishops had that they should be doing justice to the marvelous reality that Christ is, there also lay some much less lofty political concerns. So I need to introduce you to some of the players in this conference. It's all about the natures of Christ. And we'll come back to this icon again next week. This is the oldest icon of, of Jesus that I know of. It's from this time period, actually, the sixth, possibly the seventh century. So the warmest proponent of the idea that it's best to talk about Christ as being two natures mysteriously joined was this man. John Nestorius. He became the Bishop of Constantinople in 428 when he was, you know, at a mature age. And because he was the Bishop of the world's most powerful city at the head of the world's most powerful empire, 
his ideas carried a lot of weight with people on the one hand. On the other hand, his position of great power also exposed him to the jealousy, the intrigues, and if it were today, we would say the trolling of people who really, really did not like him and would much rather see themselves or one of their friends in his position. So as you can see from the dates of his episcopacy, he didn't last very long as Bishop of Constantinople, 428 into 431. And part of the reason why he didn't last, apart from you know, the natural desire of everybody to take him down, was that he was much more of a pastor than he was a theologian. He wanted Christianity to be user-friendly for the majority of the people who espoused it, but who did not have an extraordinarily high level of theological education. And he found that people had trouble with the idea of Mary as the mother of God. People found that a little bit scandalous or a little hard to wrap their, their minds around. And so he dialed it back a little, softened the, the terminology and said that instead of calling Mary the mother of God, we could call her the mother of Christ. Now to us, that might not sound like a terrible thing even though you know, we certainly use the word astvazamayr very freely. But it mattered because when he was younger, John Nestorius had studied in Antioch, which was the third great city of Christianity in that world. So Constantinople is the first, Antioch is the third, and the issue is going to come with the second center. Because Nestorius's chief opponent <laughs> was, truth be told, much more of a theologian than a pastor. This was Cyril. Here's a nice fresco of him. Very revered for his intellect and his clarity. He was the bishop of the Christian world's second most important city, Alexandria. He was the heir to a great dynasty of thought. He had a very clear and demanding mind, high standards intellectually and spiritually, but he also had a very, very rough disposition. And because Antioch is his, his sea's closest rival for authority and prestige and for influence on the thoughts of Christians worldwide, he harbored an abiding dislike of Antioch and everyone and everything associated with it. And so when Nestorius became the Bishop of Constantinople, Cyril, pre-hated him. <laughs> Maybe he knew about him before, I don't know. But as you can see, Cyril is the older statesman. He's in office much, much longer than Nestorius is. And behind those dates lies a fight and Cyril loved a good fight. In fact, he loved fights that weren't quite so good too, as we'll see. So round one, between these two thought worlds was the Council of Ephesus in 431, a debate between Nestorius's preferred way of referring to Mary and behind it, the, his idea of, that it's better to focus on the two natures of Christ being united, focus on the humanity of Christ on the one hand and Cyril's thoughts on the other, which is that Mary is definitely mother of God, and that Christ is one. First and foremost, everything else is secondary. So it was clear that this was going to be a really contentious council because both Nestorius and Cyril are kind of polarizing personalities. 
And so when the council met, bishops who were pro-Antioch, bishops who were friendly with Nestorius, met together. And pro-Alexandrian bishops, bishops who thought like Cyril, met together. And the whole idea was that they would each have their separate meetings and they would see if there was a way that they could kind of come together and make a compromise between the two positions that everybody would be happy with. This was the emperor's dream. <laughs> compromise position, consensus position. And of course it did not happen. So the emperor finally got involved. Nestorius was exiled in order to try and pacify the Alexandrians. So Nestorius went south to Egypt, but many of his followers, and this is where it becomes important for Armenians, many of his followers went east. Some of them went all the way to China. And so it's very interesting that the first great Christian missions to the Eastern world are Nestorian missions. And you can see how far they went and how what they did intersected with, for example, up here in the north, if you see the, the route that's going up towards Mongolia, you can see that they intersect and they kind of follow and weave around in what was called the Silk Road, the big trading route between China and the Near East. And so taking advantage of the uh, booming economic towns and stops along this route, the Nestorians spread their Christian message all the way to China. Others of them went south to India and around and up to China the, the other direction. And so in China, there are things like this. This is a giant stele, which is what these monuments with writing on them are called, which gives the history of the mission to China by the Nestorian missionary Alapen. And we have beautiful illuminations like this one that shows a Chinese Nestorian priest leading a Palm Sunday procession. And when time comes for the Mongolian Khans much later to begin choosing um, a religion that will give them a better grip on their empire, Nestorian Christianity was a top contender. Others of the Nestorian refugees didn't go as far as China. They settled instead in Persia, where the Persian government welcomed them with open arms as people who had suffered under the hands of Persia's arch enemy, the Byzantines. They gave them preferential standing. And in fact, they made Nestorian Christianity the Christianity of the Persian empire. And perhaps you can begin to see that that will have an effect on Armenian Christianity. But while that's all going on out in the East, things are still plugging along in Byzantium with the Nestorian issues. When Cyril died in Alexandria, one of his deacons, a man named Dioscorus, succeeded him and took up the fight against the ideas of Nestorius, even though Nestorius was no longer around. And Dioscorus, who was also celebrated as a saint and a teacher in the church, was even more combative and forceful than Cyril had been. And in cases like this, where you would hope for some um, nuanced diplomacy between groups that you know everyone is Christian, maybe we can work this out, um, that's not going to happen. Personalities really do matter in how issues are handled. So in August 449, after a lot of lobbying, after another council and all kinds of other things that we are not going to pause to talk about, although they are fantastically interesting, Dioscorus pulled together a meeting of 135 bishops in Ephesus. And at this meeting, he presided. That's 
interesting. He's the number two bishop. What's he doing presiding at this? And when bishops came to the meeting, they discovered that not only was he presiding, he was presiding with an armed guard st standing all around him. And they locked the doors at certain key points in the debate so that opponents to his opinions would be excluded. <laughs> the Bishop of Constantinople, a guy named Flavian, <clears throat> of course he's there, he's the hosting Bishop effectively. He's the Bishop of Constantinople for heaven's sake, the number one city in Christianity did not agree with Dioscorus on something. And he was beaten so badly that he later died of his wounds. That's a heck of a church council. <laughs> it left a bad taste in everybody's mouth, except, of course, Dioscorus. But he had intended this council, even in, even in his bellicose kind of mind, he had intended this council to nip the opposition to his ideas in the bud, get everybody on the same page, doing what he wanted them to do, and it didn't. What it did do <laughs> was to guarantee that two years later, when Chalcedon happened, every bishop who came there came with a grudge. Every bishop who came there had an account to settle with somebody else at that meeting. It was guaranteed, too, before the meeting even took place, that anybody having opinions that sounded like Dioscorus's opinions was not going to get a hearing. You'd probably get a chair thrown at him instead. Armenians happened to agree with Dioscorus. Theologically, they didn't agree with his approach. So should they go? Should they not go? Would it be worth sitting there through 18 sessions of discord, out of which they would probably come away with a lot of insults thrown at them or not? Well, this whole council was ill-omened from the get-go. You can see here's a, a little picture. This has toned it down just a bit for what was happening, but you can see in the front foreground, the two bishops who are kind of pulling at each other's cloaks. That was one of the milder altercations at Chalcedon. And you can see the emperor is sitting back there kind of maybe trying to put some brakes on it. This was later sanitized a bit. Here's a, a different portrayal of the Council of Chalcedon. You have the emperor and empress shown rather younger than they actually were, hearing an oration by people who are sitting decorously watching what's going on. Well, that was not the case. Just before the council happened, this emperor, Theodosius II, who had been trying like crazy to get some order out of the chaos that was beginning to devolve around this seemingly, this issue that really ought to unite Christianity, not divide it, died in a tragic riding accident. never getting to see the council actually held. So the person who convened it, <laughs> person who convened it was his older sister, the Empress Pulcheria. People loved making fun of Pulcheria. And um, you know, the more you read about her, the more you can kind of see why. <clears throat> when she was younger, her, her brother's emperor, so she decided, she's a very pious woman, that she would take a lifelong vow of celibacy okay, that's fine. And she liked like sleeping on a, uh, a straw mat on the floor of her palace bedroom and so on. She's very ascetic in her desires. Well, as soon as he died, leaving her in charge, she realized that the celibacy thing is not going to work. She needs a husband in order to be able to hold that position and somebody who has good military experience and good military connections. So the most important general in her army said, well, there's this guy who's my personal assistant. You can see him on the right. <laughs> His name is Marcion, and I think he'd make a good husband for you. And so she said, okay, God will have to forgive me for this. So she married him in due time. They did have a daughter, but she convenes this council 
trying to appeal to the best instincts in the bishops who are going to be present. And she knows that there's a lot of bad blood going into this. So she called the council to meet at Nicaea where the first great council of the Christian empire had been held under Constantine the Great, when things were new and there was, everybody was excited about the programs that were going to come out of it. <clears throat> so it convened at Nicaea. There were between 520 and 630 bishops present, which means that you also have all of the entourages of all of those bishops. And you can just imagine what happens when you put that much testosterone together in a room. <laughs> between people who have good reason not to like each other. It was so unruly that the council had to be moved to Chalcedon, which was a little suburb of Constantinople right across from the Imperial Palace so that she and the troops could supervise it better. And the politics around the council were fierce. It turned out to be a council of Rome trying to exert its authority against Alexandria, against Antioch, and other little seas were pushing to try and get you know, more power for their own, this includes Jerusalem, trying to get more power for themselves by joining up with the right side. It was, it was something. But in the end, they reached a compromise. Christ was two and one. Okay, it's a very beautifully worded compromise. And Armenians actually had nothing against this idea. And in later centuries, Armenians will say, you know, there is no difference between what we teach and what you teach, except the position of a word in a sentence. However, the Armenians had many other reasons to be ambivalent about Chalcedon overall. 75% of the Armenians, including the Catholicos, were living in the Persian Empire. Remember, there is no Armenian state in this time. There is no Armenian state during Avarai. There is no Armenian state during the discovery of the, or, or the invention of the Armenian alphabet. Armenians are split. 25% of them living in territory controlled by Byzantium, 75% living in territory controlled by the Persians. And the Persians have been pushing the Nestorian Christian line for themselves in order to tick off the Byzantines. But when the, when the, the decision of this council began to be circulated, the Nestorians in Persia welcomed it with open arms. They said, see, you cannot, you cannot actually talk about Christ without using the word too. And that's what we've been saying all along. That's what we wanted to say is you can't just take him and say he's one because then people are going to think he's either human or he's divine. You have to use the word too. And they were thrilled about this. And so if the Armenians said, yes, we sign on to the Council of Chalcedon's decisions, the Persians would say, wonderful, how good is this? There is no difference between you and these newly arrived Nestorians in our, in our territory. We are going to give you all one Catholicos and you can be one happy family. And of course the Catholicos will be from the newly arrived Nestorians, right? And the Armenians are looking at that and we knew, <laughs> no, because that means we're gonna cut off 25% of our population, first of all, we're not going to do that. And secondly, you know, they just got here. <laughs> All right. So just to make that situation a little bit more complicated, Armenians also could not say no to the Council of Chalcedon. So on the one hand, they can't sign it and say yes, because that will get them subsumed under the Nestorian church. On the other hand, if they say no, Council of Chalcedon, no, that's something's completely wrong with that. We want nothing to do with it. Absolutely not. The 25% of Armenian population living in the Byzantine Empire is going to be vulnerable. 
and it's going to jeopardize any good relations that the Armenians might have still with the, Pers with the Byzantine Empire. And so what's the best thing to do in a situation like that where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't? <laughs> if you haven't had to live in such a situation, I'm sure you will at some point in your life. So what were they going to do? They ignored it. Calcedon never happened. Yeah, just, we don't mention it, doesn't come up. Best course, just leave it alone. After all, you wanna wait and see whether a council that was actually substreperous and this cantankerous gets any traction or not. Is it one of those things that really matters or is it not? And it was not condemned in Armenia until more than 50 years after it actually met. The rejection of it took many years to materialize. And the Armenian church did do a lot of self-examination during that time to see how would we prefer to formulate those points that were raised at Chalcedon. And when they finally did reject it, in sections. Their rejection was not so much a matter of theology as it was a statement of ethos, of identity, a statement that the Armenian way of looking at things divine is not that of the Byzantines. And right at the end of the century, it was the Armenian Katoligos Hopan Mantagumi, who you see a fantasy picture of here because we have no idea what he actually looked like. It was he who definitively set the Armenian emphasis on practical Christianity rather than on the fine points of theological debate as most characteristic of Armenian life and faith. Catholicos John Hovanes generally opted for the practical results of faith on the idea that it's all very well to talk about faith, but unless you live faith, what is it really doing for you or for the world? How faith should work itself out in life, how faith should work itself out in liturgy is much more important than how faith should work itself out in kind of um, these ethereal debates about terminology. And so from his pen, we have numerous canons, regulations. He enriched the night office of the church, the midday service of the church, wrote hymns, beefed up the sacrament of marriage so that it was even more beautiful, added to the rites of blessing for a church's foundation, for the vessels of a church, for vestments. And he also patronized the translation of 3rd Corinthians into Armenian. If you've never heard of 3rd Corinthians, there's a reason, it's no longer in the Bible. However, the Armenians loved and used it. It's a very practical little book, no surprise there. And it's actually worth reading and Bishop Vahan Hovanisian wrote a book about it, which you can probably still find online. So the Armenians were not alone in this stance of holding Chalcedon and its decisions in abeyance just to see how it shook out. Evidence also shows us that the Council of Chalcedon had practically no effect on the Holy Land for a good many years after its formulation was promulgated and made official. Evidence shows us that Greeks, Armenians, Syrians, Ethiopians, and Copts, who are now supposedly on different sides of this theological divide, continued to inhabit together monasteries like this one. Do you recognize this one? This is St. Theodosius near Bethlehem. And if you go there, you'll find Armenian graffiti on the wall, ancient Armenian graffiti on the walls. There were monks here who were Armenians, monks who were Greeks and so on and so forth. They continued to live and work together just as if the council never happened. Lovely situation. It all changed in the sixth century. And it changed because of this. What do you see in the depiction? You see a sports stadium. 
and in the stadium is taking place a chariot race. And you can see there are like teams of, of racers and the horses are all stretched out. Very exciting thing. This is what changed the whole tenor of Christian life. Not the Council of Chalcedon itself, but sports. Chariot racing changed the face of Christianity. Sports were a big deal in Byzantine life. Of course, so is religion. So pro-Chalcedonians had their teams, their favorite racers, and anti-Chalcedonians had their favorite racers. And there was a lot of name calling back and forth and there were jerseys and there were drunken fan brawls. There were the, you know, everything that goes along with rowdy sports. So by the time you get to the emperor Anastasius, three emperors on from Chalcedon, all of this was quite entrenched. You know, it was very important whether you favored this team or you favored that team. And that was what discussion was at dinner. It was all about the sports. and the uniforms that came with it. Pro-Chalcedonians backed the blue team. You can see them on the lower right. Non-Chalcedonians backed the green team. You can see them on the upper left. This is a nice mosaic floor where somebody had you know, their favorite racers <laughs> enshrined so they could watch them during dinner. So it's the blues versus the greens the blue Chalcedonians versus the green non-Chalcedonians. Well, when Anastasius died in 518, it's about 70 years after the Council of Chalcedon has happened, but this is living on in the, in the racing world. And he kind of felt that things were ripe for a change, but he didn't want to be stuck. He had three nephews. He didn't want to be stuck taking sides between those as to who was going to succeed him, who's going to be in charge of the sports driven empire. And so um, he tried to the best of his ability to make sure that it was not him who picked one of them, but that it would be God who chose. And so he invited his three nephews to a banquet. And under the pillow of one bench, he didn't tell them where to sit. Under the pillow of one bench, he put a little note that said, rain. R-E-I-G-N, you will reign. And then he just waited to see, what's God going to decide? Which of these guys should be my successor? Well, they came in, and <laughs> wouldn't you know it, two of them got cozy on one bench, and one of them took the other, and the, the one with the paper, nobody sat on it. So what's he going to do? And he says, well, God, obviously, I'm, I'm sorry. I must have picked the wrong modality for finding out your will. So he didn't say anything to, the, to these young guys. He said, all right, God, I'm going to ask the three of them to come and see me tomorrow. And the first one who comes through my bedroom door, he's it. And so he's, you can imagine, he's not sleeping very well that night, he wakes up gets his coffee, sits down, and the first one to walk through his door was his nephew, Justin, who was a peasant, military commander, uneducated, he was illiterate actually, married to a slave girl. And Anastasia said, well, okay, God, this is obviously the one that you want. And only he would have believed <laughs> that this was the one that God chose. But maybe he was right, because Justin, peasant though he was, illiterate though he was, was very shrewd. And so he did not try during his reign to make big policy changes, big economic policy, anything of that. What he did was to make people happy. Putting on public games, handing out gifts, holding public banquets. It was very healing. He restored to people fun and amusement. Maybe he also had some faith in his adopted son. His adopted son was named Justinian. 
Here's a nice picture of Justin. There's not really much we have from him. His son Justinian was a rabid fan of the blue team. He was very pro-Chalcedonian. In fact, the whole family were rabid blue fans. It's like the difference between having Jets and Giants fans in the same family. This, these, were, these were Jets fans. And just for fun, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen these, but uh, online there's somebody who redoes the portraits of ancient people like this in order to upgrade them to what they would look like now. <laughs> Here's a nice redo, modern redo of what Justinian would have looked like. So it gives you kind of an idea. <clears throat> Who does it look like to you anyway? So <laughs> Justinian becomes emperor and then Justinian met Theodora, gorgeous Theodora with her, you know, unibrow and her enormous dark eyes and her long neck, she was just fabulous. And there was a slight problem. She had a questionable past. She was the daughter of a barkeeper and a female acrobat. So she came to the stage as a performer. This was not you know, something that an up and coming woman would do. And then she got a position, which is what they called it when you became the mistress to a bureaucrat. And that took her to Egypt. And in Egypt, wouldn't you know it, she had a religious experience. So um, she realized she had to leave this guy that she had been mistress to, and she wanted to get back home. Well, she only really knew one way how to make her way back there, how to get the money together to do that, but you know, it's okay. So she came back to Byzantium, a changed woman. And when she got back, she went to a sports meeting for fans of the blues. And at that meeting, Justinian saw her. And that was it. He saw her across the room and he knew that this was what he was going to do with the rest of his life. There was one problem. His mother would never, ever, ever allow this. And so he waited a year for mom to die. And then he married her and she became the co-ruler of the empire. But it's one of the most extraordinary stories ever. And it was a blue empire. It was a Chalcedonian empire. Much of whose land lost over the years, he was able to regain by pulling his army together around the sports thing. And so since it worked for unifying the army, he thought, well, this pro-Chalcedonian stuff will also work to unify the empire. It's great, we'll have a really, really blue empire. And he began insisting that people who belong to his empire should show their loyalty by accepting the Council of Chalcedon, signing off on its um, statement of faith and, and becoming part of this great new enterprise. And his very, very clear favoring of Chalcedonians, in fact, his pro-Chalcedonian policy had reverberations that were felt all the way across the empire and through all of its client states. One example of how it affected Armenians is that it uh, caused the eviction of Armenians from the holy sites in Jerusalem, breaking up that happy cohabitation in monasteries, stiffening lines of division. Armenians wrote back, Armenians who were living in the Holy Land wrote back to the Catholicos in Armenia to say, here's our choices. We can either sign off on Chalcedon and keep our holy places, or we don't sign off and we lose them. What should we do? What does your holiness suggest? And he said, um, don't sign it. It's better that we lose the properties than that we lose our identity. And so they did. So the hardening of lines between Chalcedonian Byzantines and non-Chalcedonians who didn't actually care about sports in Constantinople and who lived mostly on the Eastern end of the empire really didn't help Justinian in the long run because he realized he needed the Eastern end of his empire in order to maintain peace with the Persians who were his enemy. But it was too late to mend fences, even though in his old age, he personally modified his faith to something that was much more like what the Armenians espoused. 
So on the one hand, he cut off his own support for Byzantium from the eastern end of his empire by his religious stance. And at the same time, the struggle that he was forced to continue maintaining along his border with Persia was very expensive, was very tiring. And in the course of this struggle between the irresistible force and the immovable object, the treasuries of both powers were emptied, the troops were decimated, and things generally were left at a much, much weaker level than they had been before. And that will become very important next week. There was also a secondary effect on Armenians. You may not recognize this from the back, but this is a famous statue of Vatan Mamigonia. And during this time period, the Mamigonians were very pro-Byzantine, faced their own identity crisis, and eventually died out across the sixth and seventh centuries. Here's a nice picture of Vatan Mamigonian's tomb as it was about a hundred years ago. And so they who had been kingmakers had practically ruled the Armenian military for centuries, simply faded away and died out, leaving behind them a power vacuum. And into a power vacuum, someone else will always step. And this becomes the great opportunity for people like the Bagratids to begin their rise towards power. But the hardening of these Chalcedonian lines also opened a door of opportunity, or maybe they just precipitated a moment of decision for the Georgians, who up until this point in time have been part of the Armenian church. Not as subservient to the Armenian church, but um, in a kind of a marriage between the two Christian cultures. And right at the end of the century, the Catholicos Patriarch of Georgia, a man named Curion I, decided that the moment was right to get more distance between his church and the Armenian church. Up until that point, a very strong-willed Armenian Catholicos had been in power, Catholicos Movses. And so Curion made his plans and waited for the opportunity to come for him to remove his church from its close relationship with the Armenians and to set it on an independent path. When Katoigos Movses died, a successor was not immediately appointed and Curion realized that God had smiled on his plans. Instead of a Catholicos, the Armenian church was in the care of a locum tenens, a person who would kind of hold the spot, take care of day-to-day -day business and so on. A very intellectual man named Vertanes. So <clears throat> what will be the incident that allows Gurion his independence. The occasion for what the Armenians later called his rebellion was a dispute with an Armenian bishop who was under his jurisdiction, Bishop Movses from the province of Tsurdav, province on the Georgian Armenian border. The whole border area of what's now Georgia and Armenia, there's now a line that runs through it, was a very mixed population of Georgians and Armenians. And so in some areas where there was a predominantly Armenian population, you would have an Armenian bishop. In other areas, you would have a Georgian bishop. They all report to Guria as the Catholicos of the area. So there's a problem between the two, between Bishop Movses and his Catholicos Guria. And in the end, <clears throat> Movses decided to flee into Armenia and try to enlist help from locum tenens Vertanes. So we have letters from Vertanes to various people who were involved in this, trying to piece together what was going on. But the whole, uh, the whole question 
seems to have been that Moses was worried about steps that Gurion was taking that he felt were anti-Armenian. So for example, there was a, uh, here's a nice Georgian inscription. This is the area we're talking about. There was a monumental cross that was put up by St. Nune before the actual conversion of Georgia. And this had been a pilgrimage shrine for Armenians coming from farther south to come up and visit this cross and venerate the beginnings of the Georgian church. And that had been cut off as a pilgrimage destination for Armenians that are no longer allowed to come there. There were also other things that were happening that, that, that Bishop Moses felt were prejudicial to Armenians. And he had complained about this to Catholicos Gurion. And Gurion said, well, come and talk to me about it. Why don't you come spend some time at the Catholicos eight? And so Moses got very worried about this. And you, you know how it is when you're anxious about something, your mind will go to places where things haven't yet happened. So he didn't show up for his interview with his Catholicos. This is never a good idea. Do not not show up when the Catholicos invites you. So Catholicos Gurion sent to him again and said, no, I really want to see you. And so rather than going to see Gurion the second time, because by this point, he's talked himself into being fearful for his life, um, Moses headed south. And he had a tearful farewell from the people that were in his diocese, you know, pray for me. I'm, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen. And he gets them all worked up and he gets himself all worked up and he heads down into Armenia and it's getting towards winter and he stops at Hovanavank. Do you know where Hovanavank is? If you've been to Hovanavank, it's not that far from Ichmiadzi. It's not that far from Devine. So you, you're thinking, okay, if you got that far, then why not take that little extra couple of miles and go to the center of the Armenian church and present yourself in person and talk with Vortanas about this issue. But he didn't. Instead, he stayed at Havanavan. And while he was there, he wrote to Vortanas describing the problem. The Georgian Catholicos is against us. He's doing this. He's doing that. I barely got away. You know, it was very dramatic. And so, <laughs> and so Vortanas gets this letter. He's not the former Catholicos, he doesn't have like the iron will and the say, okay, let's get to the bottom of this. I know Gurion is difficult, but I really don't believe he'd do these things. So Vortanes gets on his high horse and he writes a letter to Catholicos Gurion in Georgia saying, what do you think you're doing up there? Why are you being mean to my bishop? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing to the Armenians there? We're so sad to hear about this. You're behaving really badly. Well, what would you do if you're Gurion and you get this letter? you would send back a pretty snippy answer. And that's exactly what happens. It's like, this is, this, is my, this is my church. I'm the Catholicos here. Your bishop is subservient to me. He didn't come. I called him twice. He's making accusations against me without proof, et cetera, et cetera. So that letter goes to Vortanes. Vortanes gets that letter and he says, well, Moses, what about this? And Moses, oh, no, 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 it's terrible, it's terrible. And so Vortanes sends another letter to Gurion going, now you stop this. <laughs> And you can see the personalities of these people are taking this situation, which admittedly is not a sweet situation, and turning it into World War III. And so the upshot of this is that Gurion effectively tells the Armenians, don't tell me what to do anymore. I'm signing up by Chalcedon. That makes me Byzantine. I'm no, I, I'm no longer interested in this relationship. And that took care of that. It didn't change the way the population was arranged in this area. If you go um, up into the northern part of Armenia and you stop at the little village of Kopayat and you go up to its monastery, you'll see that it's covered in inscriptions. Most of them are in Georgian by Armenians or by Georgians. It really didn't matter in the region. People were completely mixed together. The beautiful monastery of Achtala covered in Byzantine frescoes. It's an Armenian church and fortress. People didn't make those artificial distinctions when it was put up. Here's its altar area. When you go to Halbat, you see the same thing in the cemetery. Tombstones are written in Georgian. They're written in Armenian. You have both. People were bilingual in the area. They hung out together. They got married. 
all of that is going to come to an end. And this whole split will happen, although it's been prepared for a long time, it will happen as fallout from Chalcedon, and it will happen during the three years when there was no one sitting on the Armenian Catholic coastal throne. How much can be done, how much damage can be done by certain types of personalities really quickly when things are not well researched, thought out, and approached. And there have been repercussions from this acrimonious divorce until the present day. Achtala, which I showed you before, is under dispute between the Georgian and Armenian states. Halbad is not, but um, it's, it's a very tense situation. Armenia also faced its own internal split. Above and beyond the Chalcedonian, non-Chalcedonian taking of sides, which is going to also affect Armenia as well as the Armenian-Georgian relationship, not exclusively in areas of Armenian population within Byzantium or close to Byzantium, but um, very much there. There's also going to be a complete kind of break with the mainstream Armenian church because of, in a way, Chalcedon because of the fallout from it, because of all the kind of acrimonious backbiting and um, arguing that happens around it about things that the average person is going to look at it and go, that is such a fine hair, I don't even know how you plan to split it. Why would I care? <laughs> You're getting so off. Would Jesus have cared whether you called him one or two? This is their argument. So do we really need all of the elaborate liturgy? Do we really need the hierarchy to live the life of Jesus? And so Armenians who associated all of that kind of thing with Christological debates that seemed to them to be meaningless and irrelevant, plus the people were scandalized from time to time by the misbehavior of some of the mainstream clergy, there was a whole sector of the Armenian population that simply opted out This hierarchical fanciness had nothing to do with Christianity, they felt. They wanted a return to the first century simplicity of Christian life without all the ceremony, having no use for clergy, feeling no need for such for as church weddings, baptisms, Eucharistic liturgy, rituals. These people withdrew in large numbers to the fringes of the areas where the mainstream church's authority could reach. Such as here, they will later take on the name of this, this region. This is um, north of Lake Van. It's a very mountainous, difficult area called Pendurek. And later the, the grassroots Armenian Christians will be called Tondrakites from Pendurek. You can see it's a pretty wild landscape. <clears throat> but these grassroots Christians were not a negligible force. It used to be thought that they were pretty much a lower class movement. That's not true. This is one of their towns, the remnants of one of their towns. And you can see it has quite large fortified walls. And the more that they are being studied, the more it becomes clear that they were a society within the society. They had their own internal kind of government. They had their own internal social services. Some of their leadership were from the Armenian nobility, drawn from noble houses like the Bagratuni. And they were large in number. This was a movement to be reckoned with. And the mainstream Armenian church would reckon with it from this time until today in different guises. And I think personally, I, I think that this is a good thing that having opposition on the part of people who sincerely want a return to a simpler variety of Christianity is one of the things that helps to keep the church 
balance that helps to keep it honest with itself that helps to make sure that it tries to maintain its own standards of behavior and, and goodness and so on. That might be a minority opinion, I realize, and hierarchs would not probably agree. So while all of these things are going on in and around Armenia, unbeknownst to practically anyone in the Byzantine Persian world, things are starting to happen, to brew, to bubble elsewhere that are going to set this Byzantine, Armenian, Persian world on fire. That are gonna turn it upside down and that are going to mark not just their history, but all of history forever, or at least for much longer than the Byzantine empire extended its influence across the Mediterranean world. And that's what we'll talk about next week what's bubbling, what's brewing, and what else is going on while it's bubbling and brewing. And 